Hey everyone, this week we're looking at a really nice little compact camera from the 1980s which seems to have flown underneath the radar. It's the Ricoh FF9. I recently did a review of this camera on Cosmophoto. Uh, I've had it for about seven or eight years and I think this is the next Colt Compact because it's got some really surprising features. It's got a great lens uh, and at the moment it's really, really cheap. So Ricoh did a range of compacts in the 1970s and 80s uh, under the FF designation. Uh, a lot of them were autofocus cameras, but they actually started with a, a sort of Minox look-alike 35mm camera uh, called the FF1. And the FF range sort of developed over the 1980s until in 1988 they released this, the minimalist FF9. The FF9 has some really interesting minimalist Japanese 80s design touches to it. There's very little going on around this camera on the outside other than the usual shutter button and the LCD display on the top. And on the front you've got this little cover which when you open it, it actually activates the camera. And it's a really surprising little camera. Um, when I bought this in about 2014, I didn't know very much about it. I knew Ricoh had made uh, a load of nice SLRs, especially in M42 and Pentax K mount through the, the 70s and 80s. They made some, uh, some really interesting compact cameras. But the FF range, I didn't know a lot about it. So I took a punt on this camera. It cost me £9.50, uh, which for US viewers, it's less than $15. Uh, bought it off eBay. And after using it for the first couple of rolls, I was kind of blown away by what good pictures it takes. It's really sharp, it's really contrasty, and the color rendition is fantastic. So this is a camera that does pretty much everything for you. There's obviously motorized, uh, film advance, autofocus. You can rewind this manually, however. There's a little uh, rewind override button that you can push with the, the point of a, a pen. Something else that's sharp. That's a nice little feature for the FF9 that uh, some compact cameras from a similar time don't have. Like a lot of 1980s cameras, uh, the wind is a little noisy, but it's certainly not as noisy as a lot of them. But it's certainly a, a bit noisier than cameras like the Olympus Mu or the Yashica T4. You have to bear in mind that this camera is from a generation before and it does cost a fraction of those cult compacts. This was definitely intended for holiday makers, um, people who wanted a, a fully automatic camera. So the camera reads the DX coding off the film cassette. Uh, it's quite a wide latitude. It goes from 100 ISO, which is something you'd use for a sunny summer day, right up to 1600, um, which is pretty useful if you want to take this camera uh, around at night uh, and get some atmospheric shots without using a little integral flash. You can't override the uh, ISO manually, so if you wanted to, say, put 400 speed film and push it up to 800 or 1600, that's not something that you can do with this camera. A lot of this camera's contemporaries had the same limitations, so it's not something I would uh, particularly point the FF9 out for. The camera has some really interesting modes, um, some I've never actually seen on any other camera. Uh, and the modes can be accessed by this little button on the side of the camera. These modes include a multi-exposure mode where you can take two or more shots uh, on the same frame of film through to uh, a timed mode where the camera will take a shot every 60 seconds until the uh, roll of film is used up. Um, apparently the FF9's manual uh, says that this is quite good for taking pictures of 
kids playing or your pet. Another mode is a burst mode uh, where the camera will take a shot every second. It has a really interesting mode. Again, uh, I need to state I've never seen this on any other camera. A TV mode. And what this does is it uh, widens the aperture up to f4 and it takes the shutter speed to 1 30th of a second and that's designed to allow you to take a shake-free picture of something on a television screen. This seems uh, quite quaint but you have to realize that the FF9 dates from the 1980s when obviously a lot of the digital technology we use today was either in its infancy or not yet invented. So on the back of the camera it has this uh, film reminder window uh, and that is quite helpful uh, if you load a, a film and then suddenly don't know if uh, you're shooting black and white or color well these little windows help remind you. So that's a nice thing to have. Not all com compact cameras from the late 80s had one. One thing with this camera is if the camera thinks that it needs the flash on, it will power the flash. So let's have a look at that now. There we go. You can hear the whine of the motor wind. Um, like I said earlier, it's louder than maybe some of the compacts from the 2000s, but it's not very loud. You can override this automatic flash by simply placing your finger over the flash and pushing the shutter button. Now you may find that that image is slightly underexposed but I've often found uh, the camera will open the aperture up as wide as possible and bring the shutter speed down. I think the slowest shutter speed on this camera is 1 15th of a second. Uh, and often that's enough to get a properly exposed shot. It's just often with these compacts, the exposure system sort of erred on the side of including flash. You're not gonna do the camera any harm by uh, preventing the flash from firing. Um, it seems to have been something that was intended because I've done this dozens of times over the life of this camera and it's still going just as well as when I first picked it up. Are there any drawbacks to this camera? I mean the automatic flash uh, function is not something I like in a compact camera but the override is uh, a nice way of preventing uh, the flash going if you don't want to use it. The looks seem to divide some people. Uh, I think it looks quite stylish and a sort of Darth Vader um, you know, Japanese design kind of way. Um, some people think it, it's the least stylish of the Ricoh FF9 cameras. I, I think that's down to the, the individual photographer. The autofocus is really reliable. It, it's not the hundreds of uh, different distances that cameras like the Mew2 had, but it's certainly uh, more likely to hit it than not. Uh, I can't think of many shots I've lost due to the, the sort of lower spec autofocus range. It's got uh, room for a strap here if you want to um, carry the camera with the strap. Can be useful to have if you're, you know, off the beaten track and, um, you know, in, in summer our hands can get a, a little sweatier so we're more likely to drop a camera. This has some nice textured um, finger holes which make it quite comfortable to hold. And you have this uh, sort of slight grip design on the body of the camera, which again makes it quite comfortable to hold. It's that sort of design that you, I don't suppose you realize it until you're actually holding the camera, but it does help make it a more pleasing camera to hold. It's not the, the slimmest uh, compact camera I've used. Quite chunky, especially when you see it from the, the bottom. It's not particularly heavy, but again, it's going to feel a little heavier than cameras like the T4 or the Olympus Mu. But again, it's a camera that comes at a, a fraction of the price tag. So this camera cost me less than £10. Uh, admittedly, that was in 2014 and the prices have gone up a little, but you can still find these for £25, sometimes a little more if you want something that's boxed with a manual, with a, a case, but still 
I'd be surprised if people are charging more than 40 pounds for these. I think this is a really good deal. In fact, I'd call it a steal for a camera like the FF9, which has some really surprising strengths that you only realize when you're shooting with it.